All right, so tonight we're going to continue on our, our uh, series from Shadows to Reality. Uh, we've been looking, the first time we met, we looked at Catholic biblical interpretation. So how do we interpret the scripture from a Catholic point of view? And we realized that we had to take into account the spiritual, uh, both the literal and the spiritual levels of the scripture. So part of the literal levels of the scriptures looking at God's words that he gave. So we looked, we began to look at um, uh, the prophecies and how the words that God speaks in the Old Testament prepare for to do uh, in the New. And then um, after that we're going to start looking into typology, which covers the spiritual aspects of the text. How God uses uh, his actions and deeds in the Old Testament to prefigure things that would happen in the new. So today we're going to finish up the portion on prophecies. Uh, so but before we begin that, we'll begin with our Lexio Divina, our prayer. We're calling down the Holy Spirit, reading the scriptures, and then offering God's God praise. Using this coming Sunday's gospel. So let's begin. Come Holy Spirit, fill our hearts assist us with the help of your grace to hear and to heed your holy word. Help us to recognize your future comings, in, especially in your, your Old Testament uh, prophecies. Help it to continue to change our lives so we will become closer to you. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. John the Baptist appeared preaching in the desert of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It was of him that the prophet Isaiah had spoken when he said, A voice of one crying out in the desert, Prepare the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. John wore clothing made of camel's hair and had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. At that time, Jerusalem, at that time, Jerusalem, all of Judea, and the whole region around the Jordan were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River as they acknowledged their sins. When he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce good fruit as evidence of your repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God can raise up children to Abraham from these stones. Even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that does not bear good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I am baptizing you with water for repentance. But the one who is coming after me is mightier than I. I am not worthy to carry his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is, at, is in his hand. He will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his barn. But the chaff will be burnt with unquenchable fire. <coughs> we spend a moment just thinking of what in this passage stood out to us, how God is speaking to us. <coughs> What stood out most for me was the quotation from Isaiah, since we're going through uh, prophecies tonight. That's what's in the forefront of my mind, of how God is making straight the path through John the Baptist uh, to prepare for Jesus. Can we spend some moments to respond in prayer to our Lord? And now the, the portion of contemplation where we, we sit and listen and allow Christ to speak to us. Okay. 
complete our time praying the psalm for this Sunday. And as always, we'll do the refrain together and I'll do the verses. So, together. Justice shall flourish in his time and fullness of peace forever. O God, with your judgment endow the king, and with your justice the king's son. He shall govern your people with justice and your afflicted ones with judgment. Justice shall flower in his days and profound peace till the moon be no more. May he rule from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. For he shall rescue the poor when he cries out and the afflicted when he has no one to help him. He shall have pity on the lowly and the poor. The lives of the poor he shall save. May his name be blessed forever, as long as the sun his name shall remain. In him shall all the tribes of the earth be blessed. All the nations shall proclaim his happiness. All right. With wonderful readings during Advent, I love the readings. Uh, if you've been going to, especially masses during the week, you'll notice they pretty much have all been from the prophet Isaiah. Um, he's used more than any of the other prophets for the first readings during Advent. Um, so we're going to look. We covered some of those passages from Isaiah last time when we looked at the prophecies. Uh, but we're going to review some of the ones we went over since now that we're in this season. Um, should have more meaning to us now that we're living through this period of time. So we'll, we'll briefly look at some of those again. So... Here, there is our order that I mentioned earlier. We went through biblical interpretation. Now we're on the second day of prophecies, looking at God's words. And then the last three times that we meet, we'll be focusing on uh, typology, God's deeds. Um, so the words proclaim the deeds and clarify the mystery that's in the deeds themselves. So God is speaking words about the deeds. But then the deeds themselves confirm what he said, and they also signify further realities that will occur in the New Testament. So we, so typology is the, uh, the study of those Old Testament events or types, which we'll look into. Um, if we get through, I, I have a, a little bit of an introduction at the end of this if we happen to get through everything. Too fast. <laughs> we'll look at it. Um, so a lot of this material comes from uh, uh, Dr. Lawrence Feingold. He was a professor that I took some classes with him, and he 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 is Jewish in his background. Um, uh, Jewish first, then became an atheist, and then eventually became a Catholic. So a lot of his material that he does makes this connection between um, Judaism and the Catholic faith. So he makes these wonderful connections between the mystery between Israel and the church. So I use a lot of his material. To review, why does God use prophecy? There are several reasons. Um, first, we have to understand that Jesus is the center of God's plan of salvation. He's the center of everything. But in order to get to Jesus, he didn't do that right away. I mean, there's plenty of history that comes before Jesus. So God is going to reveal things little by little, progressively. He has to get us ready for the moment that he's going to send Jesus so that we don't misunderstand who Jesus is because if he doesn't have Jesus in the proper context then we can begin to make him into something that he's not um, which doesn't really stop everybody from doing that because there's plenty of people who do that anyway but God is going to try to prepare us uh, he repeatedly announces this event of Christ's coming so pretty much all the prophecies have something to do with Jesus <laughs> uh, so they give, these prophecies give credibility to Jesus' claim. I mean, if for so many times there's all these things that God has been saying, and now there's one person that fits them all, well, then it gives credibility to who Jesus claims to be. Uh, knowing about them helps to uplift our faith um, because we can see the intricacies of God's plan of salvation. We can see that really there's no way... You know, all this stuff could have been made up simply by human minds. <laughs> uh, those things written at a certain time, way before that actually happened, had to have God behind it. 
Uh, so last time we went through prophecies of the Messiah. We went through his lineage, his family, and his mission. And I'm going to go through some, just a few of the ones that, that apply, have significance during this Advent season. So we looked at Numbers chapter 24, the prophet Balaam. He was a pagan prophet, and um, he was sent by the Moabite king to curse Israel. Only problem was is when he got to, to the people of Israel to curse them, God forced him to bless them instead. So he ended up blessing them. And part of his blessing was that there would be um, a scepter and a star. So there would be a king come out of Israel and would be marked by the, by the sign of a star. Um, this, of course, becomes incredibly important for the New Testament because... We have the three kings who come from afar following the star. And the only and they had to have had a reason to leave their home when they see this star to go and find a king. Well, it just didn't happen in a vacuum. They had to have read about the prophecy ahead of time and known that when they see this kind of sign, they need to head to Israel, which is what they did. So God is preparing back here in the book of Numbers, which occurs right over here, about 1,250 years before Christ, for that when the Magi see the star, they know of this prophecy, will leave their home and go find the newborn king. And uh, so here we have an, an old uh, image from the catacombs in Rome of Mary with the infant child, and next to her the prophet Balaam pointing to the star. So then one of the ones that we looked at was Psalm 72. Actually, the psalm we, we uh, prayed with tonight is from another portion of Psalm 72. Um, so this portion of Psalm 72 that we looked at says, May the kings of Tarshish and the islands bring tribute. The kings of Sheba and Seba offer gifts. May all kings bow before him. All nations serve him. So we just mentioned the star would bring kings. Well, it was already prophesied through the Psalms that the kings would come. <laughs> Not only would they there be the star, but they would come. They bring gifts to offer tribute, bow down and serve him. So should come to no surprise that this psalm is used during the Advent season. But then also, specifically, this is the offertory antiphon for uh, the Epiphany, when we celebrate the coming of the three kings. So I sang that last time, so I'm not going to sing it this time. <laughs> uh, Isaiah chapter 7. So Isaiah, the big prophet that's used during um, uh, Advent. So this prophecy is... Uh, God wants the king Ahaz to ask for a sign. Um, he's not exactly the best king. <laughs> um, but Ahaz is trying to pretend like he is. So he's saying, oh, no, that's okay. I won't ask for a sign. I won't tempt the Lord. And I was like, no, I want to give you a sign, so ask. And so he is given a sign through the prophet Isaiah. And it's the Lord himself will give you a sign, the young, the young woman or virgin, uh, Pregnant, about to bear a son, shall name him Emmanuel. So we notice that God's coming isn't going to be blocked by human effort. It's going to be different. The Messiah is going to be born of a virgin. In Hebrew, it was Alma, which does, is, is more general. It doesn't specifically mean a virgin. But in Greek, Parthenos does mean virgin specifically. So through time, when it's translated into the Greek, um, it picks up this new meaning. Um, and, of course, the, the, it's inspired. The Greek version of, of the Old and New Testament is inspired. So it, even though some scholars will try to say, well, it doesn't mean a virgin because the Hebrew word isn't that specific. Well, the Greek does add that sp specificity uh, to, the, um, uh, to the prophecy. So, of course, we see that as being a... Uh, Prophecy of Mary, and in fact, here's a, a window that we looked at where they have the Annunciation, um, and above that we have the Echeverria <laughs> Concepit, 
the prophet Isaiah uh, being linked to uh, Mary's um, annunciation in this uh, work of Christian art. Then we last time we looked at Isaiah uh, chapter 9. And in Isaiah chapter 9, it uses these different titles for Jesus that we see in the introit of the Mass at dawn for Christmas. So radiant light will shine upon us today, for the Lord is born unto us. He shall be called Wonderful God, Prince of Peace, Father of the world to come. If I recognize that reading is also used um, as the first reading. It might be in Midnight Mass. Is that right? Yes, it's the first reading for Christmas at Midnight Mass. Um, it's when that reading is used, but then for the Mass of the day, uh, I put this up because it's very interesting because you'll notice, you notice up there it gives the, the, the scripture references. So it says Isaiah 9, but then it says Luke 1. So what it does in here is it actually conjoins the two passages. So that's the neat thing about some of the te liturgical texts is that the church takes things from the Old and New Testament and it will put them together like that. Uh, so the prophecy and and its fulfillment. So then we looked at Isaiah 11, and uh, this one. Look for this one uh, for the first reading. It was you've heard, you, if you would have heard it at one point during this week, uh, one of the uh, daily masses. But you'll hear it also this coming Sunday. A shoot shall sprout from the stump of Jesse and from his roots a bud shall blossom. So the first part of that is Jesse is the father of David, the king. So here you have Jesse's family tree, David the king, and then Solomon, and then Rehoboam, and then the other kings that go all the way through. And then you have a point in which the line gets cut off as the Babylonians come into Jerusalem and uh, take the people off into exile. So the kings are no longer allowed to rule as kings. So it's like... This family tree of Jesse got cut off. It was turned into a stump. <laughs> um, of course, this prophecy of Isaiah is saying that Jesse is a stump before the family of Jesse becomes a stump. Because Isaiah, right here, Jesse becomes a stump. So, so Isaiah is this this point, and then this is what the kingdom is cut off by the Babylonians. There's no kings after that. So, so this is going to be a shoot sprout from the stump of Jesse. So there's going to be a new king that's going to rise from this cut off family of Jesse, uh, which is the Messiah. He'll be a descendant of Jesse of David. Other interesting things that we see in here is that he's uniquely filled with the Holy Spirit. And it says the Spirit rests upon him. So it's abiding um, state. If you look at it, it lists the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit um, that he will bring. Um, last time I also played, I'm not going to, let's see here. Um, might have to play it. There we go. So this is the this is one of the O antiphons. So starting December seventeenth, the golden days before Christmas, the O antiphons are sung. Um, they're used for evening prayer. The, it's the antiphon with the with uh, the canticle of Mary during evening prayer, the liturgy of the hours, as well as the gospel verse at mass uses the O antiphons. So this O antiphon on December nineteenth speaks of the root of Jesse. So a lot of these texts of the prophets are used during these these rich texts before the uh, uh, just before Christmas. So I showed you last time the uh, the Jesse tree window at the Chartres Cathedral. So at the bottom you have Jesse with the tree growing up out of him, and then you have different prophets lining up on different sides, prophets and kings. In the middle, and then at the top you have Jesus, surrounded by <coughs> doves that represent the gifts of the Holy Spirit. All seven of them. 
So the the Jesse tree, uh, something I didn't mention last time, but there's a there is a devotional practice of during Advent of putting up a Jesse tree, and so a Jesse tree basically is I mean it could be an actual real tree, it could be a representation of a tree, but you put different symbols each day that represent certain things. So for example, this might be one order of symbols on a Jesse tree. And this stresses the history of the world. So on the first day, you might have the first day of Advent, you might put up a symbol of sun, moon, stars, earth that represent God's creation. So this is the first you know, event that occurs in the history of salvation leading up to Jesus. And then you have another one for Adam and Eve, the fall, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. And so you go through all the way through um, the different people or events, and then you get to the O antiphons. And then each of these leading up to Christmas is one of the O antiphons. So there's Radix, Jesse is the root of uh, Jesse. So that's one way that it can do. Another way that you could also do it is stress prophecy and typology like we're doing in this class. So in that way, uh, you could do different things. Like So for example, this one starts with Melchizedek. Um, so you have a man offering bread and wine. So you may have heard that from the, uh, if you don't know the story of Melchizedek from the Bible, you've probably at least heard his name if you've heard uh, the first Eucharistic prayer at Mass being used. Um, he's mentioned uh, at Mass there. So Melchizedek was a priest during the time of Abraham who offered bread and wine like Jesus would do. Nobody else in the Old Testament offered in the same way, so Melchizedek is really seen as this type of Jesus. And so it continues on with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Isaiah, Jesse. And then you've got some interesting things. Like this one uses the uh, Greek sibyls, which were these women prophetic. Uh, uh, I don't know a whole lot about them, but um, there's... Some of them made some kinds of prophecies of some kind of Messiah that seems to fit in with, with uh, uh, who Jesus is. So it's very interesting that, that uh, this, this version would, would use, would refer to them. You actually do find certain places where they do refer to the Sibyls, uh, certain Christian uh, either artwork or uh, like the, the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel has Sibyls in it or... Uh, or music like the uh, um, the Dies Irae that was used at funeral masses had, as I mentioned, to sit, uh, one of the sibyls. In. So, so it's a, it's a it's a neat practice to do that way. It makes Lent or it makes Advent into Advent, so we don't get too much into Christmas. So, I'll show you what I have in my house right now. This is my Jesse tree, Advent tree. So. That one. <laughs> so that's my tree. It looks kind of sparse right now, but that's because we've only done. So when I put it up, uh, I put up, um, put a number of purple bulbs on it for the first Sunday of Advent, and then each day you have a separate symbol that you begin to put on. So this represents creation. This is the fall. Noah, Abraham, Isaac, um, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Passover. Um, and so each day you keep adding more and more. And then when it gets to the second Sunday, I add more purple bulbs. The third Sunday, I add some pink bulbs, rose bulbs. And then, you know, so eventually you get to Chris, you get up to Christmas, and it gets more and more full. And then when you get to Christmas, then you can add all the other things. So I just, that's the first time I've ever done it. So I just thought it would be a neat thing to, to do. It really, it really helps you progress, at least so far in my mind, progress through uh, Advent um, so that we're not, like, rushing forward to Christmas before it arrives. So I just thought that was a little extra thing that so we didn't talk about last time, but I thought I'd include tonight. Um, then we looked at the prophet Micah, who is a contemporary of Isaiah. And um, Micah tells us where the Messiah is going to be born. And Micah is actually quoted in Matthew chapter 2, when the Magi come and to King Herod, and ask, well, where is the Messiah going to be born? Because the prophecy about the star had just said that he was going to be in Israel. So, of course, when they came to Israel, they came to the biggest city, Jerusalem, because obviously a king would be there, probably. Uh, but the king wasn't there. So when they asked 
King Herod had his priests and scribes um, tell him where it was, and they said, well, you know, the prophet says, and you, Bethlehem, land of Judah, are no means the least among the rulers of Judah, since from you shall come a ruler who is to shepherd my people Israel. So they knew it was, he was supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So and that's why then they left and went to Bethlehem, because of what the prophet Micah had said. Um, so another important uh, prophecy that relates to uh, uh, Christmas time. Then, uh, Psalm 2. I will proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask it of me, and I will give you the nations as your inheritance, and as your possession the ends of the earth. So this may not... You may not look at it and automatically think, Christmas. <laughs> uh, but you are my son. So the, the Lord said to, to me. So the Lord is saying to the Messiah, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Or, so the Messiah is going to be the Son of God. And this is the entrance chant for Midnight Mass at Christmas. Sorry. <laughs> there we go. No, stop. I wanted to stop. So this is this so this is the first words of Christmas. Really, um, <coughs> is you? Well, it says the Lord. The Lord said to me, uh, "You are my son. This day I have begotten." So those are the first words that you hear. Uh, it's kind of neat because you have the Father speaking directly to the Son in the in this intro uh, through the song. So I just think that you know. So that's the that's really the you know a lot of time, a lot of time we don't usually hear, unfortunately, the text of the introits at mass, um, but they're so rich in 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 their origin. So it's you know, hopefully we we're moving more back towards using those those texts because they're still there. <laughs> they were never they were never gotten rid of. Um, so it's it's just beautiful the thought to ponder there. On Christmas morning, or Christmas at midnight when Jesus is born, not only do you have Mary and Joseph, but Jesus' father is there as well. And to hear him say, you know, you know, for those who have experienced the birth of a child, especially the fathers, you know, to experience that wonder, to share that with God the Father, saying, you are my son, today I have begotten you. I don't know if there's just... A lot there to ponder. Uh, another kind of devotional practice that I learned when I was in the seminary, I mentioned this last time, is the Christmas Novena. It's a Vincentian tradition that uses a lot of the prophetic texts as uh, part of it. And so it follows kind of those nine days leading up to Christmas. We did them a little bit earlier at the seminary because we're gone from the seminary by the time we get to those. We wouldn't be able to do all nine days leading up to Christmas. Back to them. So, the, for, so for example, this is what some of them would sound like. This first one comes from is based on Micah. Bethlehem, city of the highest God, out from thee shall go forth the ruler of Israel, and his going forth will be as from the beginning of the eternal days, and he shall be praised in the midst of the universe, and he shall be on earth when he shall have come. So that's part of the, there's other music that's involved in there, but he uses these, the, these are actually uh, based on antiphons, so this antiphon is from the Office of Readings of the Third Week of Advent, but it's based uh, on Micah, uh, that Micah passage that we looked at earlier. So 
it's just a, uh, a lot of rich texts that are used in that. Uh, if you're interested in that, I did a recording of the uh, of the novena. It's just myself singing it, so I try to sing like parts, and it's not that good. But <laughs> it's not as good as an actual real production. But you can get at least a little bit of a sense of what it would sound like. Uh, interesting. I I, uh, I did find out that uh, they have a they have a new um, music uh, director at the seminary at Kenrick, and he's looking to they kind of move they kind of stopped doing it, but he's looking to restart it again. So hopefully they're they're doing it again this year. So we had looked at all the the lineage of the family. The, the lineage of the Messiah is with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, David. He's going to be born in Bethlehem. Uh, we didn't go back over this, but we also knew a, an approximate time period about when he would arrive, that he would be a blessing for all nations, that he would crush the devil, and but he himself would be bruised. And it's that last part, that he will be bruised, that we're going to look at next. So we're going to move out of the Advent Christmas season now into a set of other prophecies that we'll discover are used during a different time of the year. But these are, they're just going to progressively get more amazing <laughs> with the details that they have. So the, 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 there are four songs of the suffering servant in the prophet Isaiah, in the book of Isaiah. So the first one is from Isaiah 42. And so when you, when you go through it, it talks about God's servant, this, this person who's going to be a servant. Here is my servant who I hold, my chosen one with whom I am pleased. Upon him I have put my spirit. He shall bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry out nor shout nor make his voice heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break, and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. So it continues. I'm not going to read all of it. To open the eyes of the blind, to bring out prisoners from confinement, and from the dungeon and those who live in darkness. So the elements we see here is that there is going to be a unique uh, servant of the Lord. That the Spirit of God is going to be upon him. We saw that already from one of the other previous passages that we looked at in Isaiah. Uh, Isaiah 11. He is, he is going to have the authority to judge the nations. That's going to be one of his roles. He's going to have concern for the sinner. And he's going to deal with them mercifully. He, the bruised reed he will not break. Uh, he's going to bring about a new covenant. And his mission is going to be universal. So this, this is the first one that talks about the servant. Now there's not direct reference to the suffering part in this one. Uh, but we'll see it start coming forth in the next ones. So then Isaiah 49 Again, the, the prophet begins to speak about the Lord, the servant. Before birth, the Lord called me. From my mother's womb, he gave me my name. Though I thought I had toiled in vain, for nothing and for naught spent my strength. Yet my right is with the Lord, my recompense is with my God. For now the Lord has spoken, who formed me as his servant from the womb. That Jacob may be brought back to him, and Israel gathered to him. It is too little, he says, for you to be my servant, to raise up the tribes of Jacob, and restore the survivors of Israel, I will make you a light to the nations, that my salvation will reach to the ends of the earth. Thus says the Lord, the Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, to the one despised, abhorred by the nations, the slave of rulers. When kings see you, they shall stand up, and princes shall bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful. The Holy One of Israel has chosen you. Thus says the Lord, in a time of favor I answer you, on the day of salvation I help you. I form you and set you as a covenant for the people to restore the land and allot the devastated heritages, to say to the prisoners, come out, to those in darkness, show yourselves. So I'm going I'm to, these next um, song, songs of the servant, they're so beautiful that I'm going to read uh, pretty much all of it. So he mentions about the covenant again. I'll form you and set you as a covenant for the people. That he'll be a light to the Gentiles, like to the nations, not just for Israel, but it's going to, this new covenant that's going to come about is going to reach beyond simply Israel itself. It does mention that he's going to suffer to the one despised and poured by the nations, the slave of rulers. But his apparent failure to gather Israel won't be a failure. 
When kings see you, they shall stand up, and princes shall bow down, because of the Lord who is faithful. So it begins to bring some the element of suffering in here. Then we go to Isaiah 50. The Lord God opened my ear. I did not refuse. I did not turn away. I gave my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who tore out my beard. My face I did not hide from insults and spitting. The Lord God is my help, therefore I am not disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, knowing that I shall not be put to shame. So we see this begins to deepen this experience that the servant, the Messiah, is going to undergo. He's continuing going to be meek. You know, he gives his back to those who beat him. He doesn't refuse. He doesn't turn away from what he's being called to. He trusts in the Lord, but he will undergo insults and spitting. And then we go to the fourth song, Isaiah 53. He grew up like a sapling before him, like a shoot from the parched earth. He had no majestic bearing to catch our eye, no beauty to draw us to him. He was spurned and avoided by men, a man of suffering, knowing pain, like one from whom you turn your face, spurned and we held him in no esteem. Yet it was our pain that he bore, our sufferings he endured. We thought of him as stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our sins, crushed for our iniquity. He bore the punishment that makes us whole. By his wounds we were healed. We had all gone astray like sheep, all following our own way, but the Lord laid upon him the guilt of us all. Though harshly treated, he submitted and did not open his mouth. Like a lamb led to slaughter or a sheep silent before shears, he did not open his mouth. Seized and condemned, he was taken away. Who would have thought any more of his destiny? For he was cut off from the land of the living, struck for the sins of his people. He was given a grave among the wicked, a burial place with evildoers, though he had done no wrong, nor was deceit found in his mouth. But it was the Lord's will to crush him with pain. By making his life as a reparation offering, he shall see his offspring, shall lengthen his days, and the Lord's shall be the Lord's will shall be accomplished through him. Because of his anguish he shall see the light, because of his knowledge he shall be content. My servant, the just one, shall justify the many. Their iniquity he shall bear. Therefore I will give him his portion among the many, and he shall divide the spoils with the mighty, because he surrendered himself to death, was counted among the transgressors, were the sins of many, and interceded for the transgressors. Now this was written 700 years before Jesus. And so if that doesn't give you chills reading that <laughs> of the kind of details that you have or the kind of depth of understanding of what the servant would do I mean the, 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 the theology of the guilt of the people being placed upon the servant himself is just incredible so the suffering and humiliation that the servant is going to undergo is, is it's magnified beyond anything that we saw previously. Um, and the suffering is voluntary. It's undertaken as an expiation for the sins of others. Even though he is the just one. He's the just one. But he will justify many. Uh, he's the perfect holocaust. Again, he's silent and meek. He opened not his mouth. And he will die. But even though he will die, it says... That he will extend, let's see, where is that at? Yes. He will lengthen his days. His days will be lengthened, but he will die. But his days will be lengthened. How does that work? <laughs> so, let's see. How does the church use these? Use them during Holy Week. The four... Songs of the Suffering Servant are used in order throughout Holy Week. On Monday, we have the reading from Isaiah 42, where it talked about he would judge the nations. There would be a new covenant. And what happens on Monday of Holy Week? 
when Jesus goes to the temple and he judges the people in the temple, throws out, places this judgment upon them. Uh, the second day, uh, Tuesday, you read from 49, in which it feels as though there's going to be an apparent failure of the suffering servant. And what does Jesus do on Tuesday of Holy Week? He talks about the destruction of the temple. Um, but if you destroy this temple, I will raise it up, which he's talking about himself. So his apparent failure is actually going to bring about uh, the tournament. Wednesday, um, in Isaiah 50, it talks about being betrayed and being rejected. Um, and what happens on Wednesday? Jesus is betrayed and rejected. Then on Good Friday we read Isaiah 53, the deepest expression of the suffering of the suffering servant and the death for his sins and what happens on Good Friday. Jesus undergoes his suffering and dies. So this is a beautiful, beautiful way that as a church we use these prophetic texts. It gives the meaning. It, it draws out um, what's going on in those texts. And there's so much more, especially Isaiah 53, to ponder all those elements that are going on there. But there's more. <laughs> there's Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? For I am a worm, not a man, scorned by men, despised by the people, all who see me mock me. They curl their lips and jeer. They shake their heads at me. He relied on the Lord. Let him deliver him, if he loves him. Let him rescue him. Like water, my life drains away. All my bones are just disjointed. My heart has become like wax and melts away within me. As dry as potsherd is my throat, my tongue cleaves to my palate. You lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of evildoers closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. They stare at me and gloat. They divide my garments among them. For my clothing, they cast lots. I remember Psalm 22. That was written before Isaiah. So you go even further back. And the extent of the details of the sufferings of the servant here. They correspond with Roman crucifixion. And this is before the Romans were in charge. <laughs> the bones being out of joint. That's what happened when you were placed on the cross. Suffering thirst. Hands and feet being pierced by the nails, which wasn't even a normal practice. Usually they'd just be tied up there. His body totally exposed. His clothes divided, casted for, um, with lots. The kind of details in that uh, corresponding to what actually occurs to our Lord. And Jesus prays this from the cross. The words, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? That's Psalm 22. <coughs> and uh, Pope Benedict, reflecting upon this, is what he has to say. This cry expresses the desolation of the Messiah. The Son of God, as he faces the drama of death, the real reality utterly opposed to the Lord of life, abandoned by nearly all of those who were his own, betrayed and denied by his disciples, surrounded by those who insult him, Jesus is placed under the crushing weight of a mission that must pass through humiliation and abdignation. He therefore cries out to the Father, and his suffering takes on the painful words of the song. But his is not a desperate cry, nor was that of the psalmist, who in his supplication journeys along the path of torment that nonetheless opens to a vista of praise and trust in the divine victory. So if you read the rest of the psalm, it opens up to praise and the victory of God. And since according to Jewish use, this is Benedict again, to cite the beginning of a psalm implied a reference to the whole psalm, obviously Jesus could not recite the whole psalm aloud, hanging on a cross. Jesus' heart-rending prayer, while full of unspeakable suffering, opens to the certainty of glory. Which is why, in Luke chapter 24, after he rises again, he says, Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter his glory? 
That's what the risen one said, will say to the disciples on the road to Emmaus as he breaks open uh, the scriptures. I'm sure explaining these songs of the suffering servant in this, in this psalm. During his passion and obedience to the Father, the Lord passes through abandonment and death in order to attain life and to grant it to those who believe. In painful contrast, Psalm 22's initial cry of supplication is followed by the memory of the past. And so this is Psalm 22. And in thee our fathers trusted. They trusted and thou didst deliver them. To thee they cried and were saved. In thee they, were, they trusted and were not disappointed. One final thing on this passage, if you've one of the most profound liturgical moments for me was when I was at Conception Seminary for Holy Week and I heard the Gospel of St. John uh, chanted um, uh, for on Good Friday. And so I have the small portion of the gospel. It's just as you know, we experience the passion narrative. And we have, you know, the priest reads the part of Jesus and then someone else reads the other two parts. Well, it's the same way when it's sung. So you have three people singing and the neat thing is, is that the, uh, the narrator part has a certain tone. And then when you have a speaker, the tone moves up. But then when you have Jesus, the tone moves down. Um, so you have three different tones. So I'm going to try to uh, do this little section of the gospel from Good Friday. From noon onward, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And about three o'clock, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani, which means, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? So to hear the whole Gospel of John be proclaimed in that way is uh, you 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 hear that gospel in a new way, and so another passage that goes right along the same lines is from Wisdom chapter two. I won't read all of this one. Uh, for you. But if you look down here, well, starting at the top, it says, Let us lie and wait for the righteous one, because he is annoying to us. He opposes our actions, reproaches us for transgressions of the law, and charges us with violations of our training. So here you have the enemies of the righteous one complaining about him. They basically are showing that they need to change. <laughs> they don't like that. So he calls, he calls blessed the destiny of the righteous and boasts that God is his father. Let us see whether his words be true. Let us find out what will happen to him in the end. For if the righteous one is the son of God, God will help him and deliver him from the hand of his foes. With violence and torture, let us put him to the test, that we may have proof of his gentleness and try his patience. These are words of persecution of, of the persecutors of the Messiah. That he calls himself the son of God, but instead they mock torture, and kill him. This is from Matthew, chapter 27. Those passing by revealed him, shaking, reviled him, saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross. Likewise, the chief priests and the scribes and elders mocked him and said, He saved others, he cannot save himself. So he is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross now, and we will believe him. He trusted in God. Let him deliver him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the Son of God. I don't know if they knew <laughs> that they were repeating the words of the persecutors from the Book of Wisdom. But they're very close to being the same. <laughs> so, once again, such amazing parallels. Uh, words that were written much, much before they actually the events happened. Then you have Psalm 118. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. By the Lord has this been done. It is wonderful in our eyes. So this speaks to how the Messiah is going to be rejected, 
by the ones in authority, the builders. But he will become the foundation upon which the kingdom is built. This again is quoted by Jesus during Holy Week, Matthew 21. That he knows what will happen, and he tells them, well, it's been predicted what you're going to do. <laughs> so, um, Psalm 118 is known as the Great Hallel, and it's sung as part of the Passover. And it was likely the hymn that's mentioned when it says that Jesus and the disciples sung a hymn and then went out to the garden. It's likely that Psalm 118 was part of that hymnody that they sung. So it's part of this liturgical practice of the Jewish people at Passover as well. This rejection. So earlier I was reading the words of Paul Benedict and uh, so he was he was referring to this passage where Jesus is speaking to his uh, disciples uh, and to the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he said to them, Oh, foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke! Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter his glory? Then again, with, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. So, wouldn't that have been amazing to see Jesus describing, going through, what, basically doing what I'm doing, but only much, much better. <laughs> Because <laughs> he's Jesus, so I mean, who knows the scriptures more than him? <laughs> so going through, it says go being with Moses. We didn't even we didn't even look at Moses. We'll look at Moses more when we go through typology. But you know, Moses and all the prophets, and he said, "Didn't you? I mean, you, if you know you know the scriptures, didn't you realize the Messiah had to suffer? I mean, did you read Isaiah? I mean, there's like three places, and then what about Psalm 22? I mean, there's all these different places where it talks about the yeah, answer." But it's, it's much easier for us to see it looking backwards than it is for them to see it looking forwards. Because they had within their own idea of what the Messiah was supposed to be like. They didn't want the suffering servant Messiah. So I could imagine why they wouldn't really put too much emphasis on those. You know, it's kind of like, well, I really like this passage. And I don't really understand that passage, so we'll just leave that over there. And, but this passage I like. You know, but no, Jesus says, no, you've got to take it all. So, that's, yeah, that part's, that's the intense part, so, <laughs> we go through the suffering servant. So, maybe at Holy Week, come back to that, <laughs> and really ponder those, those, uh, those readings from Isaiah and Psalm 22. So now what we're going to do is we're going to go to the prophecies of the Messianic Kingdom. So all those prophecies that we went over have to do kind of specifically with Jesus himself. Um, but before we do that, we take a break. So we're going to look at the Messianic Kingdom. And this, actually there was a good question during the break of, well, you know, why are there so many, you know, you have kind of this clarity of in certain of these passages, well, why didn't, especially the Jews who knew it so greatly, why didn't they see it? You know, why didn't they see this in Jesus? The fulfillment of the Messiah and all these prophecies was referring to him. Well, one of the biggest um, arguments against that it being Jesus is, well, the prophecies of the kingdom that would become was that there would be a universal kingdom, that peace would be established by the Messiah. And um, this is kind of paraphrasing a, a Jewish scholar of a Messiah who leaves no decisive impact on the world is no Messiah. And so the question is, has the kingdom been realized? That, has it been realized? That would be their response. Well, it doesn't seem like the world's any different now that Jesus has come and gone. So he couldn't have been the Messiah. He's supposed to change something. So, that's, so has it changed uh, anything? So let's look and see what exactly are these prophecies about the kingdom. And do we see any fulfillment in them. So we go to the book of Daniel. Um, here we have the dream of King Nebuchadnezzar, which is a, ba a Babylonian king. Who, he was the one who took everybody out into exile. Um, so while you watched, a stone was hewn. So Daniel's describing this dream to Nebuchadnezzar because Nebuchadnezzar actually forgot his own dream. And so Daniel is required to tell him not only the meaning of the dream, but also what the dream was. 
Uh, while you watched, the stone was hewn from a mountain without a hand being put to it. Uh, ark. Actually, let me explain the first part. So <laughs> the first part of the dream, which isn't listed here, um, Daniel describes this statue in his dream. Uh, whether it looked exactly like that, I don't know. But uh, the statue is comprised of different metals. So you have gold, silver, bronze, iron, and then the speed is iron and clay. And so these different metals, Daniel says represent different worldly kingdoms. So the gold represents Nebuchadnezzar and the uh, kingdom of the Babylonians. So our timeline here is the Babylonian part right here. And then the, then the, uh, the silver metal of the, uh, represents the per Medo-Persian Empire, which would come next. So you would take over from the Babylonians. Then the bronze <laughs> section represents the Greek Empire, which would take over after the Persians. And then you have the Roman Empire, which is represented by the iron, and after the Roman Empire begins to crumble, so you have it uh, uh, the, the, the mixed with clay. There's some weakness there. So, But God says that while you watched, a stone was hewn from a mountain without a hand being put to it, and it struck its iron and clay feet, breaking them into pieces. The iron, clay, bronze, silver, and gold all crumbled at once. Find us the chaff on the threshing floor in summer, and the wind blew them away with, without leaving a trace. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. So there's this great contrast between the stone that comes that's not hewn by human hands. So this is not a human-made thing, this stone. And it destroys the statue, which is made up of human-based empires. So the statue represents these world empires, and the, st the, the stone, not cut by human hands, grows into a mountain, fills the whole world. So the stone is the Messiah and his kingdom. So he says, the, king, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed or delivered up to another people. Rather, it shall break in pieces all those kingdoms and put an end to them, and it shall stand forever. So the kingdom, which we, is going to be an institution that is not human. So no matter what we do, we cannot cause this mountain, this stone that's been formed by God's hands to fall and collapse, which is exactly what Jesus promises in the church. That the gates of hell can never prevail against it, that no matter how much we screw it up, especially its leaders, that we can never destroy it. And so we've had 2,000 years of seeing that we haven't been able to destroy it yet, no matter how hard we try. <laughs> And, no, and none of the enemies of the church can destroy it, no matter how hard they try. Let's see here. Yes, so Jesus is described as the cornerstone in Psalm 118 that we looked at earlier. And then he also gives this authority of being a stone to Peter. You are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and it will never be destroyed. The gates of of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. And then he continues, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. So he's linking the kingdom to the fact that Peter is the rock upon which he's building the church that will never be destroyed. So he's using these elements from Daniel. You know, that there's going to be a stone not hewn from human hands. So this authority that of Jesus that's given to Peter is not of human hands. Um, and it will outlast all other human nations, and, and it says that it, it will never be destroyed. It will fill the whole earth. And uh, um, that's what the kingdom will be. Uh, another vision from Daniel. This is a dream that Daniel has. Uh, in his dream, he, he sees four beasts. And uh, the four beasts, again, represent the same as the four metals in the statue, the four empires that are to come. And the beasts are destroyed. And at the end of this, this vision, uh, Dan, this is what Daniel sees. As the visions during the night continued, I saw coming on the clouds of heaven one like the Son of Man. When he reached the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, he received dominion, splendor, and kingship. All nations, peoples, and tongues will serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away. His kingdom, kingship will one that shall not be destroyed. Now we already saw in earlier passages the title of Jesus, 
son of God in the Psalms. But this is different. This is son of man. But son of man is also a messianic title used here in Daniel. Because here he is, one like the son of man, so a human person, who is seated on the throne before the Ancient of Days, God the Father. Um, so he is the one who has the kingship that is never destroyed over all nations. See how this is used in the New Testament. Jesus refers to this text in response to the high priest Caiaphas during his trial before his death. So let's see the, uh, the rendition of this scene um, from the Passion of the Christ. Jesus is quoting Daniel 7 right there. You will see the Son of Man coming up on the clouds of heaven. He's taking this title, this vision in the book of Daniel of the Messiah to himself. And of course, Caiaphas knows it because his reaction there, blasphemy. You just called yourself God. Um, and she's like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's because I am. <laughs> so he's taking all of this, all the, this, this, the kingship, the, commit, the, the, the kingdom that he has, his domain is over all. Then we go back again to Isaiah. Uh, in days to come, which means the age of the, the Messiah. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest mountain and raised above the hills. All nations shall stream toward it. Many people shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the Lord's mountain, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may instruct us in his ways and may walk in his paths. For from Zion shall go forth instruction. And the word of the Lord from Jerusalem, he shall judge between the nations and set terms for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. One nation shall not raise the sword against another, nor shall they train for war again. This was used earlier this week. Uh, another Advent passage from Isaiah. <laughs> so this is speaking about the kingdom, of the aspects of the kingdom. That all nations will flow into the kingdom. That there isn't going to be, you know, this nation is going to be part of the kingdom, and this is going, going to be excluded. Um, so we see that in the universality of the church, that you find the church in within all nations, that it, you, there's no nation, a nation church is not what the church is. I mean, the nation and the church don't, there was at times in history where they kind of got blended in, but that was really improper because the kingdom is bigger than the individual nation. Uh, so the church is bigger than the individual nation. And so it speaks of God's laws will teach peace. It will bring about a certain kind of peace. Uh, look at three kind of passages that are going to uh, be saying certain things, similar things about, uh, about, the, uh, about this coming kingdom. Uh, it has to do with being a light to the nations. So in Isaiah 49 that I will make you a light to the nations. In Isaiah 60, the nations will walk by your light. In Psalm 72, he will endure like the sun. All nations will serve him. So these elements of him enlightening, bringing uh, light to the nations um, with the Messiah in the kingdom that he's going to come. So how is that used in the New Testament? If we look to the canticle of Simeon, 
the presentation of the Lord. Um, and if any of you pray night prayer, you would pray this canticle every single night. So every single night, this is the part of the prayer of the church. Just before going to bed, uh, this is what you say. And this is a, a version, uh, a, a sung version of the canticle of Simeon from Luke chapter 2. Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Your word has been fulfilled. By your hope I so see the salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of every people. All right to reveal you to the nations, and the glory of your people Israel. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and will be forever. Amen. So, the, these, so the, the canticle of the words of, of Simeon, after he sees the child Jesus, recognizes <laughs> this is the Messiah of which the prophets have spoken of. And so he says, yes, now I can go in peace, which is the peace that the Messiah would bring. I, I have peace now because these words that I've been longing for to be fulfilled are now fulfilled. My own eyes have seen him. He is right there, which you have prepared in the sight of every people. So God has revealed it in, in, to everyone. He, and so he becomes a light to the nations, the glory of the people of Israel. Um, so we say it as a church every single night. Because that day we should have seen the salvation. We have meant to encounter Christ each day. Some days we do better than others. But we sing with, with, with Simeon, yes, I have encountered him. And because I've encountered him, because of my relationship with him, I sleep in peace now to the night. So whether, whether I'm awake or asleep, whether I die before I wake, I am with him. So, in these beautiful words that we pray uh, each night, it's part of uh, night prayer. Um, so, there's this kind of, the, what the, uh, uh, you saw in those, those passages from uh, uh, Isaiah and the Psalms, um, being fulfilled in Christ's coming, uh, Simeon recognizes that he indeed is the one who fulfills it. Uh, then, the New Covenant. Um, before we look at the passages that talk about the New Covenant in the Old Testament, first we have to look at what a New Covenant would be referring to, because there's more than one covenant in the Scriptures. So a covenant is, uh, basically it's, it's like a contract, but it's between, it's instead of an exchange of goods between two people, it's an exchange of persons. It's a giving of oneself to another. So that's what a covenant is. So the first covenant, and the covenants are between God and us. So the first covenant is with Adam, and uh, so you could you could talk in terms of well, Adam had a specific role within the covenant. His husband, the the institution that was created was marriage, <coughs> and then the sign, the the sacramental with a little s, sacramental <coughs> sign was the Sabbath. And so the same way, if we go through the, the covenant then with Noah. Um, with Abraham, with Moses, and then with David, each have their the rules that they're given. The the larger and larger institutions. See how God is expanding things. He's beginning to add more and more. So here's the covenant: the two people, Adam and Eve, and then you bring it to a household. But then as as Israel becomes bigger, it expands to the tribe, and then the whole nation of Israel, and then the nation becomes a kingdom. Um, but then there's a hope of a new covenant. And we read about that in Jeremiah and Ezekiel. So, in Jeremiah, see the days are coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors the day I took them by hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. That was the covenant with, no, with Moses. They broke my covenant, though I was their master. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days. I will place my law within them and write it upon their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So it's a different kind of covenant that he's going to make, unlike the ones before. Uh, and then in Ezekiel, he says, I will take you away from the nations, gather you back to your own soil. I will sprinkle clean water over you, 
to make you clean from all your impurities and from all your idols I will cleanse you. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove the heart of stone and place it with a heart uh, from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. So there's something new that's going to happen. And the law of God, which before with, with, with uh, Moses was written on stone and given to them in the Ten Commandments, he says now this is going to be different. It's going to be written upon their hearts. So let's see what this new covenant is. In Luke, then he took the bread and said the blessing, broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. And likewise the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which will be shed for you. So, you mean, this isn't just random words that Jesus is using when he's talking about new covenant. <laughs> this has meaning to them from the Old Testament. That now God is, he is setting up a new covenant unlike any other. Uh, so let's look back again at those passages. So, we see that the new one is going to be superior. This new covenant that's going to come. It's going to be superior to the older covenants. It's going to bring about a true forgiveness of sins. And it's going to write upon the law upon their hearts. And we're going to see it's going to be by the grace of the sacraments that Christ's new law is going to be written. Uh, with Ezekiel, there's, there's a cleansing that's going to occur. I'll sprinkle clean water over you. should make us think of specifically the sacrament of baptism. Uh, and we're enabled to, to follow the law. In the Old Testament, the problem was they had the law from, from the Ten Commandments, but they weren't able to follow the law. It just showed how bad they were following it. <laughs> they didn't have the ability, the power to do so. But then in the New Covenant that he establishes, he says no longer is it going to be a law in stone, but it's going to be written on your hearts. And so it's the Holy Spirit himself who comes to dwell within us. The Holy Spirit is the new law living within us. And it's the Holy Spirit that enables us to follow the law that we previously were unable to do so. Because we can't do it by our own power. It requires the, li the pr living presence of the Holy Spirit within us. That's why it's so incredibly important in the Christian life, this uh, giving our, our life over more to the Holy Spirit, to allow him the one to begin to recreate Christ in us. Um, because he is, I mean, he is the one who changes everything. He's the one who enables us um, to uh, follow the law. That's why it says, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you so that you are able to do that. It's the Holy Spirit. It's God himself. Malachi 1.11. One of the later prophets um, this is a small portion from, from him. From the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is great among the nations. Incense offerings are made to my name everywhere in a pure offering. For my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. So, in the time of the Messiah, there's going to be incense offerings, a pure offering is going to be offered, where? From the rising of the sun to its setting, which means everywhere, from east to west. Everywhere. So a pure offering is given worldwide as part of uh, what is going to happen when the Messiah comes. So the question is, do we see this? Well, we have the sacrifice of the Mass. Jesus himself is the pure offering that's offered. There is no other pure offering that can be offered. Only he is the one who is pure. And incense is offered as well uh, as part of the Mass. So in the Mass, in, uh, this is from, this, these are words from Eucharistic prayer number three. You'll hear the words, You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. So um, we can see that this portion of Eucharistic Prayer 3 
is drawing from Malachi 1.11. Um, it's so good that we have this new translation because you would not know that from the old translation. Because the old translation did not say from the rising of the sun to its setting. It said from the east to the west. <laughs> Which loses the whole reference to prophet Malachi in the first place. So, um, so this is a beautiful, uh, better translation that links us to the scriptural prophecy that this promise that occurs before Jesus' this time, that when the Messiah comes, there's going to be this pure offering offered everywhere. Um, and so we see it happening in the Mass. All right. <clears throat> the kingdom is proclaimed by Jesus. So a lot of what he does is he proclaims the kingdom. Um, and there's different elements that he proclaims of the kingdom. That, and so if we look at these elements, we'll see that they're elements that have been, that we've already kind of talked about in a lot of prophecies. So there's the throne of David who will reign forever, the kingdom with no end. It's mentioned in Luke 1, uh, especially with, and this is mentioned particularly by the angel Gabriel when he comes to Mary, that this is why you're going to have the prophet, or this is why you're going to have the Messiah is going to be born to you, because he's going to sit on the throne of David and reign forever, and his king will have no end. Then Jesus, in his public preaching, calls everyone to conversion, uh, to change. Uh, the kingdom will develop, but, but through the use of his, uh, uh, his description of the kingdom in uh, uh, the parables, especially, he sees how the kingdom will develop with this slow, organic process. You know, you can think of the, uh, the mustard seed, you know, growing into the large book bush and then all the birds of the, the air come to make their nests within it. So there's this organic expansion. We shouldn't expect, Jesus is saying, for his kingdom to basically bam, all as soon as he's there, it covers worldwide. No. <laughs> I mean he said he does he doesn't claim that that's what it will do, even though that's what it's looking forward to, because that's what the prophets have been saying, that it's going to include all nations. Um, it's going to include the righteous and the sinners, Jesus says. In fact, he come for the sinners it's for the purpose of making them righteous because the older covenants could not do that on their own. Um, but it will be distinct from political kingdom. So Jesus, for example, you know, makes this clear to Pontius Pilate <laughs> on his trial that you know, if my kingdom were here, then my subjects would be you know, defending me. But as it is, my kingdom is not here. Um, so which is why a lot of the Jews had a difficulty with him because their idea of the kingdom had more to do with freedom from the Romans than, which really wasn't part, I mean, it really wasn't the essential core of God's plan or what the kingdom was about. And then there's a hierarchical structure. Hierarchy, you know, simply means sacred order. So there's going to be a sacred order to it. We should expect God, what God does something, to order it. We shouldn't expect it to be chaotic. It should be ordered. So it has a hierarchical structure. There is a church. Um, uh, the kingdom is eternal. And, the, and he gives the power to forgive uh, sins. So these are different elements where you can see bits and pieces of it coming from the prophets. And then Jesus uh, really shows it forth um, in the things he says, the things that he does. So looking at all of these prophecies of the Messiah, of the suffering servant, of the kingdom, was there anybody else who claimed to fulfill these? So were there any other would-be messiahs? Well, yes, there was. If we read it, we read in the book of Acts, um, Gamaliel, he's a Pharisee. He's explaining that they, the other Pharisees want to know, well, how should we react to the apostles? Because they're going around talking about Jesus who was killed, and they claim that he's risen from the dead. And what do we do with them? Should we kill them? Um, and so he says, fellow Israelites, be careful what you're about to do to these men. Some time ago, uh, Thutius appeared claiming to be someone important, and about 400 men joined him. But he was killed, and all those who were loyal to him were disbanded and came to nothing. So here, whoever that guy was, uh, Thutis, uh, he claimed to be some kind of... Messiah, whether or not it doesn't really go into detail whether he claimed to be the Messiah, but he got 400 men to follow him, so he must have been a pretty charismatic leader. 
but he was killed, and then it fell apart. And so then he said, after him came Judas the Galilean at the time of the census. He also drew people after him, but he too perished, and all who were loyal to him were scattered. So he says, well, here's two examples of men who claim to be these great leaders. They died, and it fell apart. And so he says with great wisdom, so now I tell you, have nothing to do with these men and let them go. For if this endeavor, endeavor or this activity is of human origin, it will destroy itself. Just look at those last two. It, it will take care of itself. Don't bother. But if it comes from God, you will not be able to destroy them. Because he knows, you know, from Daniel, that at the kingdom of God, the stone, no one's going to be able to destroy that. So if this is the right one, you may even find yourself fighting against God. So a very wise man. I don't know whether at any point Gamil becomes Christian himself, but I wouldn't, have been, wouldn't be surprised. Um, but then even after Jesus, there are other false messiahs. Um, so for example, 132 AD, we've got Ben Kosheva, who tried to lead a military uprising, but ended up being defeated and brought about the slaughter of many of the Jews uh, from the Romans. So it came to nothing. Then, then much later, you've got one in the 1600s, that was basically with uh, this kind of esoteric uh, version of Judaism called Kabbalah. Um, but upon pain of death, he converted to Islam. <laughs> so there are two false messiahs that came to nothing. Compare that to Jesus and his kingdom, his church that he started. Um, the words of Gamaliel seemed to be continuing to hold true. If it comes from God, you will not be able to destroy them. So the question, has the kingdom been realized? Well, you know, in the world we see still we still see war, we still see sin everywhere. But sin every day is defeated in individual lives. The Holy Spirit takes charge of people and does have an effect as a new law to transform them. And we do have a church triumphant who live now the fullness of the peace that we experience to a small extent. You know, the peace around us may not be the kind of worldly peace that many thought the Messiah would bring, but instead, when we do live, when we, when we live with the Holy Spirit within us, then what we find is that even those things that, that throw us off from outside cannot disturb that peace that we have being in relationship with the Lord. So, has the Messiah come and had no effect on the world? Um, I think it's very, it's, it's impossible to say that he has had no effect <laughs> on the world. Certainly people can resist him, and so he may not be able to work much in effect in certain, certain ways, but he's always, his, his work can definitely be noted. And even, even in a worldly aspect, if you want a, a study of how, the, uh, how his kingdom has affected even just the worldly aspects of the world, is he, there's a book by uh, Thomas Woods, how the Catholic Church built Western civilization, and you'll see the role that the church played in the development of a lot of the things within the Western cultures. So he definitely had an effect. So we have to take all these prophecies together. You don't just simply take one prophecy by itself. I mean, if all there was was just one prophecy, well, that would be interesting, but it wouldn't be as much. So here's something that Blaise Pascal that if a single man had written a book for telling the time and the manner of Jesus' coming, and Jesus had come in conformity with these prophecies, that would carry infinite weight. If just one man would have prophesied all these things. But the reality is, there's so much more here. That you've got a whole bunch of men over a period of 4,000 years coming up consistently and invariably one after another to foretell the same coming. There's a whole people proclaiming it, existing for 4,000 years to testify in a body to the certainty that they feel about it, from which they cannot be deflected by whatever threats and persecutions they may suffer, which were plenty. <laughs> That's a quite different order of importance than when you look at it. So many prophets, 
even the seemingly irreconcilable aspects of the kind of power and authority the Messiah would have versus the suffering and death he would endure. Um, so we are the witnesses of the realization of all those things. It's our eyes who have seen it. Uh, a final thing, uh, I'll put up on the website a, a study that I did with some of my classmates in the seminary on the last part of Isaiah. Uh, scholars call it Third Isaiah. And what it really does is, it par is you can see a parallel between um, the, the church. Proto -ecclesi ecclesiology is Ecclesia's church, and so a study of the church. So a proto ecclesiology, like a beginnings of the church. So it kind of goes through where God it speaks of there's going to be the, the Israel that's been in, in exile plus foreigners. God's going to send the servant, which we talked about the suffering servant. Um, he's going to bring them, make them into a people of God. So in the New Testament, all nations through Jesus Christ are brought into the church. So there's a, tons and tons of elements from the prophecies in this third part of Isaiah that really parallel beautifully the things that we see happen in the church. So, um, which that's much more details than we want to get into. But if you're interested and want to know more, I put it up on the website, and so you're welcome. Um, to read about those, I, I I have a I have a what I put up is it's very similar to the handout you have. It looks kind of like that. So we finish prophecy. So we're looking at the words of God. Next time we will go specifically to God's deeds, looking at it from the view of typology. All right, we're out of time. But if you want to ask questions, please do. <laughs> Otherwise, we may depart.